Hi everyone and welcome to our latest webinar with SimilarWeb. Today we're absolutely delighted to be joined by Ross Simmons. Hey Ross. Hey Gerald, how are you? Keeping very, very well indeed. Thank you so much indeed for your time today speaking about all things content. As always guys, when it comes to the webinars, feel free to chat any questions you have during the webinar. We'll be going through them live um, as well as taking questions at the very end. And of course, if you um, also will get a copy of the recording over email and stuff after the webinar um, as well. So today's webinar, the title is going to be Why Marketers Should Think More Like Investors to Drive Content Results. Ross, over to you. Thanks so much, Gerald. Really appreciate it. And thanks everyone for joining today. I'm super excited to talk about this topic. It's without question, one of my favorite topics in the world. And it's one of my favorite topics to dive into. So uh, today, as discussed, we're going to be talking about why marketers should think more like investors to drive content results. So this is going to be a fun one. I'm excited to dive in and super excited to, to dive into this. But before we do, I want to take everyone back into time a little bit. I want to take you back Back into time to the year 2008 when I was just getting started. I just graduated from university. I had read a bunch of blog posts. I had read a bunch of pieces of content online. I watched a YouTube video and I thought to myself back in 2008, now is the time amidst a global recession for me to launch my very own marketing agency. So that's what I did. And I was working with small businesses. I started to work with all shapes and sizes. I was working with people who ran their own mom and pop shops, real estate companies, their own restaurants, things like that. And I will tell you, I had no idea what I was doing. Look at this chart and imagine for a second that this is the traffic of a client that you had. Or imagine for a second that this is the traffic, this is the chart for a backlink profile associated with one of the projects you're working on. Or that this is maybe the visibility of your brand in SERP as it relates to your brand that was ranking number one or number two. And this is what you were met with. It would be horrific, right? Like I can say with confidence that the vast majority of you would see this and be like, this is rough. This is brutal. This is not an ideal scenario. And I hear you. I feel you. I get you. I would and have felt the same way. Now imagine this though, it's 2008, you just graduated from university and this isn't your traffic. Instead, imagine that you just graduated from school, it's 2008 and you read a bunch of books, you watched a few YouTube videos, read a bunch of blogs and you decided now is the time. Now is the time amidst a global recession for me to buy my very first stock. That is what actually happened in 2008. I bought the GM stock at a point in which I thought it would go to the moon because it was GM. Of course, it's going to work. Of course, GM is not going to go bankrupt. That's not going to happen. It can't. This brand has been around my entire life. Well, it did. It went right to zero and I lost everything. I took an entire scholarship. I remember it like it was yesterday and I went all in on this stock and I lost it all. When I sold it, I think I like, had 25 cents return on this investment. It was horrific. But in this moment, I learned something very valuable, something that I think can be applicable to marketing and that everyone should be thinking about as you proceed with your marketing plans, as you go into the new quarter, the new year, the new, the new season for your business, you need to be thinking about marketing from a lens of investing. You see, you have to do your homework. You have to study the industry, you have to study your audience, you have to study the game, and you can't just jump in thinking that you know more about the market without studying the market. You see, the market doesn't care about your feelings. The same way it doesn't care about your feelings from a personal investor, it doesn't care about your feelings as a marketer. We have to, as an industry, invest more and guess less. For years, so many marketers, so many of us have been able to put ourselves into a seat and view ourselves more like artists instead of viewing ourselves as people who are essentially allocating energy or allocating capital to generate real business results. We've been celebrated and paid handsomely for the awards, for these abstract creative concepts and ideas then fly to, flown out to cans to get these lions and awards for coming up with creative ideas and unique experiences. But recently, there's been a shift. We've recently seen a shift in a mindset across multiple organizations where marketing is being seen less as an expense and more as an investment, right? And I think this is important. 
Instead, marketers need to really lean heavily into this idea that what we're doing, what we're creating, what we're launching are assets. Every single blog post, every single tweet, every piece of content that you create is an asset. And we need to be thinking about the ways in which we invest in these assets as marketers, right? There's no question that brand is still a very important thing. But there's, you are no longer able to get away with this idea that everything that we do in marketing, every single thing that we do, every single story we tell is meant to just drive brand. It's not possible. We need to be thinking about other intent for assets that we produce. And my goal today is for you, whether you're a content creator, you're a technical SEO, you're a PPC expert, a CMO, to realize finally that you have a role to play on the C-suite level in terms of having a discussion around how marketing can drive real meaningful business results. Your work is not just an expense for the organization. Your work is an investment in the organization's growth and stability and sustainability long-term. And we have to shake this imposter syndrome that has reaped havoc in the marketing world as a bunch of people who are kind of uncertain of whether or not we can actually make an impact. Every landing page, every blog post, every experiment, every tweet, all of these things are important. All of these things are investments and all of these things are assets. And when you think about assets and you continue to invest in the right ones, you have the opportunity to see growth like this, right? Whether it's assets that you are investing in from a personal investor, right? You look at the chart above, this is the, the index surrounding cloud SaaS stocks over the last few years in comparison to the NASDAQ and all of those other S&P 500, et cetera. And you can see that allocating and investing in the cloud and tech would have paid significant dividends. Similarly for your business, when you are thinking about the investments that you're making in content, whether it's a landing page, a blog post, a tweet, a Twitter thread, a webinar, whatever it may be, you need to be thinking about it as an investment as well. And amidst the most recent pandemic where the world kind of shut down, a lot of organizations thought to themselves, the first thing we need to pull the plug on is marketing. And looking back, that was a major mistake. Why? Because people want information no matter what is going on. Back in 2008, when I invested in GM, amidst that recession, what were people doing? They were going to Google looking for information. That doesn't change the way that we are as humans. We still want information. Even amidst chaos, we're going to Google, we're going to social media channels, we're going to the internet to connect with other people. We are spending more and more time online and we are using the internet to get answers to questions, to solve problems. Everything that you invest in today can pay dividends in the future. So the content that you create today is actually going to have the ability if there is another crisis, if there is a black swan event, if something happens three years from now, four years from now, the assets that you invest in can pay dividends even then in the future, right? When you look at the yearly trends and the volume for these phrases, it is consistent, right? It is consistently showing growth across a lot of different phrases. If you were one of those brands, such as Salesforce, to create content in the early, in 2008, and you continue to do so, all the way through to 2022, 2025, and you continue to own your name, you continue to create and invest in assets that can tell your story and get in front of your audience. That is how you win. That is how you make investments that allow you to sustain and ride the wave of any crisis and any chaos. Every piece of content that you create is an asset. Landing pages, blog posts, case studies, social media content, digital PR, whatever it may be, these are all assets. And when we talk about assets, I want to go back to the core of that word, assets. Assets are economic resources owned and controlled by a business. When you create a blog post that is owned by a business, you have developed an asset. And that asset must ideally have a future economic benefit to the company. That could be brand. That could be backlinks, that could be traffic, that could be leads, that could be social media traction, that could be thought leadership, that could be increasing the pipeline for the amount of people applying for jobs at your company. All of these things have an impact, but for some reason we lose the sight of that 
when we're creating our plans, we create plans just for the sake of creating them. We create content just for the sake of creating it. And what I want to talk about today, and what I really hope that all of you can walk away with, are some tactical, insightful ideas that you can use inside of the organizations in which you live and organize and work to really start helping shape the culture internally, to start viewing marketing as an investment. But more than that, I want to help you understand some of the unique assets that you may be sleeping on, that you may be ignoring, that you can use to unlock some amazing results in your business as well. So we're not just going to talk theory today. We're not just going to talk high level. We're going to get into the weeds, and I'm super excited to do it because I truly do believe that when you as an organization, when the culture of your organization starts to view marketing, view content as an investment, it will fundamentally change the way in which you operate and the way in which you develop a competitive advantage. So I want to give you an example. Wise.com, the brand formerly known as TransferWise, right? Kind of like a, a play on the Prince thing. They have done an amazing job at developing content, right? This was a slide taken directly from one of their heads of growth and heads of SEO, where they talked about their growth is directly related to the speed in which they ship and optimize content. Today, they're getting over 7.8 million visits on the back of content, right? The value of that content, meaning if they've produced all of these pieces of content and they're generating 7.8 million visits organically for keywords that are associated with their various uh, products and their offering, you would have to spend $11 million per month to capture that much traffic on these keywords. Content is an investment. And when you can create content that allows you to, in many ways, just rank in Google and generate organic traffic without having to constantly pay via PPC to capture that traffic, you are building what I believe is called a content moat. And a content mode is a competitive advantage that every brand can unlock when you invest in content that ultimately ranks in Google for keywords that you are able to maintain. And when you start to diversify the content that you're creating against an individual phrase, an individual keyword, or a handful of different phrases with videos, with Wikipedia entries, with questions that are being answered in Quora and Reddit, et cetera, you have the opportunity to have SERP dominance. And SERP dominance is when you actually create a true SEO mode. Content presents a massive opportunity, folks. I know that I'm preaching to the choir when I say this, but folks, when you look at it, this is an example of why content should be involved in every organization's roadmap, in every organization's playbook. Because when you look at some of the most successful online companies, when you look at some of the most successful SaaS companies of our generation, Canva, HubSpot, Shopify, Salesforce, Stripe, Fiverr, et cetera. When you look at these brands, there is a direct relationship between their success and their ability to leverage search to capture their market and own and maintain their market share, right? On a regular basis, these brands are driving backlinks. On a regular basis, these brands are publishing blog posts, publishing landing pages. They are growing at the rate in which they publish new content. They've taken a page out of the book of organizations like Mayo Clinic, Investopedia, et cetera, and they are competing with them in terms of the value of the traffic that they are capturing on a regular basis, right? It's time for us as marketers to shake the imposter syndrome and realize that we can move the needle for businesses, not just in terms of backlinks, but in terms of their actual market cap. We can have that much of an impact if we start to lean heavily into the idea that content can be a competitive advantage that sustains and helps an organization grow, right? But you have to realize, folks, that not every asset is created equally. Every single asset is different. If you are making personal investments, investing in a bond is going to be very different from investing in crypto, right? Investing in real estate is very different than investing in a stock. An investment in a dynamic landing page or an interactive tool is very different than investing in a Twitter thread or a short white paper. These are all different types of assets, but they all have a different type of objective and goal, right? I'm not here to say that one asset is better than the other. I'm not here to say that you should invest in this type of asset versus the next. I'm not here to say that you should invest in crypto or bonds or stocks, any of that, right? 
what's the the legal call out? It's always like, make sure you talk to your legal advisor before you make any decisions around what is discussed in this podcast. That's the exact same concept here. Before you make any investment in any of the tools, any of the assets, any of the ideas that we talk about today, you do have to go back to your market. You do have to go back to your audience, your situation and make decisions appropriately. Because two two people are gonna make different investments. My aunts are going to probably never invest in crypto, but somebody who is 14, somebody who is 15 might view crypto as the best investment that they can make in their life. Similarly, somebody might say, I'm not going to invest in bonds because it's not exactly the made up for me. That's okay. We have to create portfolios for our investments in marketing the same way that we do in our personal lives. And every single person is going to have different situations. Every single business is in a different situation. So what you need to be thinking about for your organization is where are we today and what do we want the future to look like and start to develop that content portfolio for your brand. At Foundation, what we often think about is content asset allocation. And when we're talking about content asset allocation, we're talking about how we should invest in content assets depending on your trajectory, where you want to go and what you're trying to build. So an organization that is already number one in their space, that is already owning the market, their investments are going to be very different than an up-and-coming startup with a team of five people. It's going to be night and day because that company that has already made it is really just playing defense while that startup trying to take their lunch needs to try to really go to the moon. So the strategy and the techniques that you're going to take are going to be very different right? Somebody who's looking for exponential growth might invest a ton in growth SEO. Someone who's trying to invest in a more moderate type of engagement, they might invest primarily a mix between validated SEO, growth SEO, social content, it might be a more balanced mix. And you might be wondering, okay, what does all of this mean? I'm going to dive into each of it. I'm going to dive into all of these so you have a better understanding of the different types. But let's say you're conservative. If you're a conservative brand, you might invest 50% of all of your assets, all of your energy into validated SEO, meaning you're going after keywords that you know you can rank for or that you know that there's demand for and that your audience is looking up on a regular basis. You're not trying to go after any growth SEOs where it's more speculative of what keywords you think might resonate with people months from now. 20% might go into sales enablement content where you're creating case studies, you're creating testimonials, you're creating content that talks about your product. These are the types of things you will be thinking about when you are investing in that more sales enablement side. Or if you're going after that growth, you might invest more into thought leadership content, right? You have to remember that a brand that is looking to unlock that high growth, they're going to make more risky investments. And it's important that you understand that there is risk associated with different types of assets, right? A white paper is very low risk. It is not the most risky thing that you can invest in. Creating a list of resources that every inter uh, the t- job title here should read before 2025 is not a risky asset to create. But engaging with influencers, engaging with memes, going after thought leadership pieces, trying to come up with quirky, interesting content quizzes and interactive tools, those things can be risky. But the return could also be very, very significant, right? You have to understand your own situation, your own space, and make investments based on that. Another content asset class that I think gets a lot of, that doesn't get enough love, is the asset class of a meme. And a meme is essentially when you're taking something from pop culture, something that is being shared frequently on social, et cetera, and you're turning that into something for your own brand benefit, right? So when Curology puts out this post and they've got Bernie in his his suit with his mittens on next to their product, like this is fun, but it's also an asset. It's an asset that generated 424 comments on social and a handful of shares, but it's risky because there's also an opportunity for you to start getting some clapback and arguments from people on the internet saying, oh, I hate this. Why are you doing this? What's this all about? Right? You have to tread lightly and understand the cultural nuances around what memes you leverage. When Telegram uses this meme, they open themselves up to get a nasty response back from WhatsApp saying, hey, don't call us out because you're doing just as bad in terms of end-to-end encryption, right? 
So you have to be okay with the idea that by doing a, creating a meme and investing in memes, there's not a lot of cost, right? Like it's very cost efficient to create a meme. The reach can be mid to high. You can reach millions of people with the right meme, but the life cycle is short. It's typically going out one day and it's gone the next, right? Like people share it, engages with it, but it's not going to have a long life cycle. The repurpose value is also limited. You can't do too much with it. You have a visual, you share it, it's done. But, and the potential brand risk can be high, right? Like this meme alone from Curology could have gone the wrong way very quickly, depending on their audience, right? 10 to 15% is typically what we're seeing organizations invest or zero to 15%. So a lot, most companies aren't touching memes even today, right? Most companies are avoiding the use of this type of content asset. So you have to ask yourself, is it worth it for you? Because the return is very much low to high. It's a risky investment. Interactive tools are also a very interesting asset class, right? What I love about interactive tools is the fact that you can use them to really generate some high value leads while also giving some amazing value to your audience. Uh, recently, Foundation did an analysis of like MarTech and what the most frequently backlink, um, what most frequently was generating backlinks in MarTech, and it was consistently tools. So when you look at companies like Shopify, you look at companies like Jobber, and they're creating these tools, there's a lot you can learn from it. If you can give people this type of free functionality to create something, to do something, to create a QR code, to calculate their HVAC load, to create a flyer, all of these things, when given away for free, are an asset that you are giving to your audience with the hope of them using it, capturing their information, and then using that to nurture that relationship long-term. This is a great asset class, but it can be very expensive. It can go from mid to high. There are ways that you can do it at cost efficiently, but there are some tools out there that will cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to develop. The average life cycle is long. If the problem that you are solving with your tool is real, then people will use it for a very long time. You can't really repurpose a tool though. Like a tool, once it exists, it's there, it, it is its thing. You can't really repurpose it. The brand risk is also pretty low. You're not going to get anybody really getting upset or angry because you decided that you were going to create a, a tool. And the allocation is also still relatively low. And I think the cost to doing it as well as um, hesitation around where to get started or design resources, et cetera, oftentimes cause people not to make this investment as well. But tools are a great, great asset to invest in. So I talked about this earlier, but when Foundation did this analysis, we took all of the, a handful of different marketing sites and we tried to see like what content was getting the most backlinks. And then when we dove into this, it showed clearly that tools were the most, in, most linkable content marketing asset in the MarTech space. So when you're thinking about the investments that you make, I encourage you to leverage tools like SimilarWeb to really figure out what it is that is generating traction in your space identify and compare multiple companies and see what content they've produced in your space or even in a space that is parallel to yours with an audience that is similar and see what are people linking to? What are people reading? What are people consuming? And then start to make decisions based off of research. Invest more and guess less. It's not enough for us to just use our gut instinct to say, oh, I think a tool will work. I think a how-to blog post is what our audience wants. What we should be doing is actually researching and studying our space, understanding the culture that we're trying to influence, whether it's marketers, it's finance pros, whether it's B2B SaaS companies, whatever it may be. Understand your niche, understand your space, and reverse engineer the most successful pieces of content that have been published in those arenas so you can ensure that you're creating content and investing in assets that are going to move the needle for you. And you always have to do a bit of a risk versus reward balance, right? If you're going into this space and you're looking for calculators and tools, ideas that you should embrace, you have to figure out what is it going to cost us to actually make this, right? What is it going to cost us to build this thing? Because we know people want graders. We know people want calculators. We know people want these types of tools, but you have to also recognize that you have other options because these types of assets can be expensive. But definitions, which were the second most linkable asset, are pretty low cost, right? 
So when you think about that, you have to also start thinking, what else can you invest in that are going to drive results? And at Foundation, we saw that stats, posts, definitions, et cetera, were being linked to quite a bit. So we started to create statistics roundups where we just covered all of the stats on LinkedIn that are driving results for B2B marketing. For one day, you, we actually ranked number one above LinkedIn.com for the word LinkedIn. Bounce rate went right through the roof. Nobody was trying to find us, but we were ranking number one. People were trying to get into the LinkedIn account and they were landing on foundation site. It was a Google mistake, hashtag issue, right? But what I want to call out here is like, these are low cost investments that you can root in research to drive real results for your business. Invest more, guess less. Other opportunities that exist outside of kind of the things that we've already discussed one of the biggest, as I've been discussing a little bit here, is the tools. And Shopify has unlocked an amazing amount of returns on the back of tools. The reason why I want to call this out is because a few years back in 2018, they bought a company called Oberlo.com, which essentially is the tool that allows people who sell on Shopify to essentially connect directly to Alibaba and uncover opportunities for low-cost products that they can resell on the Shopify stores. The traffic to oberlo.com since that acquisition has gone up and to the right consistently to the moon, right? You can do this type of thing too. You just have to invest more and guess less. And I will share with you some ideas on how you can do that without having that Shopify budget to acquire someone for millions of dollars. But before I jump into that, I wanna talk about another opportunity, growth SEO. What does that mean? What is a growth SEO opportunity? It's a bit speculative. It's when you are looking for trends surrounding phrases and keywords that have the potential to grow significantly in the months to come, right? One of my favorite tools for this is Exploding Topics. It's a lightweight tool that allows you to kind of get a glimpse into what keywords are trending overall. And about a year and a half, two years ago, they sent out a newsletter that said Substack was a growing newsletter platform that was getting a lot of increased search. That's interesting. Because today, a lot of people, a lot of folks here will probably agree that there might be subscribed to one or two substacks, right? But if you would have been able to get that email that outlined that this is a real opportunity and that it's growing, it had 4,750% 4, growth. When you get that notification, if you're able to start creating content on that topic early enough and you believe it's a high growth SEO opportunity, you fast forward two years, three years, if you are correct, and that grows continuously at that rate or even more, you have the opportunity to unlock something special. For example, amidst the pandemic, there was a rise in the amount of search volume for things like backyard offices. So what can you do with that info? If you are someone in a business who might sell office equipment or something like that, you can use this as an insight. This is a high growth opportunity. The world is going more and more remote. Is there a play or an opportunity for me to start creating content surrounding backyard offices? Is there a play for me to start taking research and inspiration from some of the most frequently searched for phrases today about home offices and then modify it for the word backyard? So when you see that there are 19,000 searches a month for home office ideas, you see that there are 16,000 searches a month for home office furniture. Can you use this inspiration? Can you use this information to come up with new ideas that apply that high growth SEO opportunity to your space? How to design your small backyard office, the best monitors for your backyard office. You can take and modify, or what I like to call a remix. You can remix old ideas that have demonstrated content market fit, meaning they have worked with an audience in the past, and you can slightly alter them to be applicable to a new angle into a new space and give it back to them. Can you do that consistently? If you do that, you can win. So Jared, I wanna dive into how people can use similar web as well to like use these types of ideas to unlock some opportunities as it relates to growth SEO. So from your perspective, what are some of the things that you can use similar web for to like uncover ideas just like this? And what should you be looking for when you're trying to uncover them? I love it. So this particular slide in particular is actually looking at what we call keyword generator. And basically it allows you to pick a core topic, as you've mentioned, for example, with things like backyard offices. And this is really the first step of you doing keyword research for those potentially exploding topics. So really the trick here is to think about trends that are actually happening in the real world where actual searchers are 
then mm-hmm. actually put in our head terms of the likes of a keyword generator to go and find out what keywords are people searching for that are related to that thing? So it right. could be for a new product, a line of business, whatever that case may be, put it in here. The second top tip to use similar web is to actually use our competitive intelligence and put in some of the big domains that talk a lot about topical topics. So for mm. example, magazines, publishers, those types of websites, and really find out using our weekly filter up to the very most recent week, what keywords are actually driving traffic to their website? And that's also how you can uncover those types of topics. Love it. That's awesome. I really appreciate that. I think the other piece here that's important that a lot of folks probably underestimate the foundation nights use all the time is the yearly trend. Like we love looking at this to see what's going on in terms of the volume. Like where is there massive opportunities? So when we see backyard office pod and we see this a bit of a spike, it's like, okay, that's interesting. Is it happening during the summer? It's like a cyclical trend here. This is something that we would want to dive into a little bit further and understand. So I appreciate that. Thanks so much. Um, another angle on this that I think I want to loop back to is like, imagine back when the pandemic first started, you happened to catch wave of this idea that sourdough bread was going to be ordered by everyone. If you remember, like everyone was buying sourdough bread, everyone was trying to find it. I think there was like, I don't know much about sourdough bread, but I could remember seeing people say like, a yeast of some sort was sold out at all of the stores that is crucial for making sourdough bread. If you had a blog about sourdough bread and you started to create pieces like how to make sourdough bread, is sourdough bread healthy? People probably wouldn't have searched for that. They didn't care. It was all about the carbs back then, but they would have been, you would have gotten some demand for sure. Whole wheat sourdough. If you had all of these insights around the content that you should be creating back then, you would have been able to unlock some amazing opportunities. And the reason why I want to resurface this and talk about it again is folks, like this is why it's important to stay on top of the pulse. This is why it's important to stay on top of the trends. The research that you do on content, the research that you're doing on your audience and on the people that you're trying to influence is actually an investment. It's an investment to help you understand what content you should create in the future, because in the future is when you're going to be asking those assets to actually pay dividends. So it's so important. And so, Ross, just to jump in as well, it's also thinking about the searcher. So one of the metrics that's actually yeah. unique to us is zero click. And it's basically mm-hmm. what happens after the searcher does a search. So it's not always necessarily just looking at the search volume. It's actually to find out what actually at a keyword level is potentially going to drive me traffic. In other words, right. which keywords drive a lot of interaction on Google, whether it's through paid search, organic search, different right. search features and so on. I love that. And from your perspective, like what do you see as um, the zero click thing? Like what's driving the vast majority of the use cases for that? Like when people are looking at zero click, what is the thing that's coming through most marketers' minds around like, this is what I'm going to use this for to think about? Yeah. So for example, if the word duvet, for instance, would have a lot of zero clicks. So right. it, it tends to get lots, lots of um, little engagement on the SERP itself. Um, it has often what we call thrashing behavior on the search engine mm-hmm. results page where they just go back from query back to reformulating it. In terms then of when we start getting into the searcher's mindset, it's really important to be thinking about, well, actually, if someone did a search for um, duvet or sardo bread or even bread, right. They're not yeah. really specific. So we're looking for things like double duvet covers. Right. Right. They tend right. to have a lot more interaction. And actually, as a result, we can really start thinking about subtopics quite quickly from a, a relevant parent topic. I love that. And I think one of the other pieces there is like when you start to understand zero click, it makes it easier for you to think of unique ways to really own that SERP. Like, is there an opportunity for you to influence what might be showing up in a featured snippet? And that's giving Google someone an answer. Like, is there a play there? Can you uncover an insight where it's like, okay, I'm going to create this piece. So I too can have a bigger role in the SERP. So appreciate that. I think the, the fundamental underling here from all of it is simple invest more, guess less. Another opportunity that I think a lot of organizations should be thinking about is the importance of acquiring assets that exist. And the folks at SimilarWeb and I have already talked about this in the past on on another webinar, so definitely check that out as well. But one of the best acquisitions that I believe has happened recently in SaaS was when HubSpot bought The Hustle. Some of you might not be familiar with The Hustle or even HubSpot, but HubSpot is a marketing, originally an inbound marketing tool. And that inbound marketing tool has essentially scaled and grown to incorporate a whole bunch of things that go above and beyond inbound marketing. 
Now they offer everything from customer success all the way through to customer service. They have an offering that is a very deep suite. And what they did was they acquired the hustle because the hustle was able to unlock an opportunity for them, specifically the opportunity to connect with a new audience. So when you think about the hustle, they are a brand that were creating content surrounding tech, innovation, entrepreneurship, business ideas, things of that nature. The vast majority of their referral traffic was coming from a site called Hacker News, aka Y Combinator, one of the largest, most successful VC companies in the world, was producing and consuming a lot of their content, or at least the people who were browsing their forums were browsing a lot of their content. So as HubSpot went out of the world of pure play marketing and into the world of targeting entrepreneurs, targeting innovators, targeting tech leaders, they seen an opportunity. They seen an opportunity to create content that would ultimately influence this audience by acquiring someone who unlocked content market fit. The hustle had content market fit with this audience. So, the hus so HubSpot acquires them to get access to their writers, to their strategies, to their techniques. And now they're able to use that to allocate those people who they couldn't reach before directly into their site. And when you look at their content, there's no question that they unlocked a cheat code, right? You look at some of the content shares, they're generating tons of traction on every single piece. This is valuable insight. It's valuable insight because now you know that every single time that their team press is published, they're going to produce something special. So organizations should be thinking not just about building, but also about buying, how you can buy content assets that exist today. There could be a blog, there could be a website, there could be a forum, there could be a community that is in your space that you could acquire and ultimately use it to unlock a massive return for your company. When I first got started in marketing, this isn't a story I talked about often, but I wanted to test this model myself. And I acquired a blog in a topic that had nothing to do with marketing because I wanted to see if I could turn that into something that generated marketing without my name being on it. So I bought a plant-based vegan Facebook group, as well as a plant-based vegan website. And I took content from that website and I shared it in the group. And I put a dollar figure on a course that I engaged a recipe maker to create for 50 bucks on Upwork. And then I shared it in that Facebook group. And I was able to pay for the entire acquisition with one single post. Don't make the mistake of thinking you always have to build when sometimes you can just buy. So I would strongly recommend that you check out the webinar replay that we did a few months back with similar web on this concept. There's a ton of value in it. But when you think about this, it's not just in the world of SaaS, right? Like you can look at companies like Everyday Health. Everyday Health is generating a ton of traffic every single month, right? A ton of traffic. And when you multiply the amount of keyword traffic that they're generating by the cost per click to acquire that traffic, the value of this entity it's probably about 10.8 million, right? $10.8 million worth of traffic is going to everyday health doc website, right? And when you think about that, that's a great opportunity for an organization like Peloton. It's a great opportunity for someone in the health space to view this as, hmm, okay, if we purchase this site, the site who has created a free tool called a calorie counter, if we can acquire this and we can take all of that traffic, all of that stuff and brand it to our story, to our message, to our, our brand guidelines and get the message that we want in front of them, you now have an opportunity to create an entire new funnel, just like HubSpot did, just like Shopify did, but in your own space, right? There are a ton of sites that you can use to do this. You can go to old sites like Flippa. You can go to some of the more new sites like MicroAcquire. MicroAcquire is a great site that every single week is sending out emails to people saying, these are some startups that you can acquire. These are some companies that are generating revenue that you can acquire. And a lot of them have blogs. And when you acquire them, you can ultimately take that traffic and turn them into a result for your business. So don't sleep on that. It is a massive opportunity and an opportunity that every brand should be thinking about because the cost isn't always as high as you might think. So when you start to view everything like an asset, it makes it easier to start thinking about acquiring these assets. And these opportunities start to show up everywhere. There are a handful of niche Slack channels, Slack groups, Slack communities on, that are interested in different topics. When we talk about Slack, we often think about it as the communication tool that we use internally at our work, right? Foundation as a remote company, we use Slack 
every single day. But we also use Slack every single day to connect with marketers, to connect with people outside of our company, because there are a bunch of Slack groups that exist today filled with people gathering to discuss things of interest to them. Similarly, in a handful of different discords, there are people gathering every single day to talk about things that are interesting and passionate and relevant to them, right? These are opportunities for you to also keep an eye out for acquisition opportunities. Not only do I believe there's an opportunity to acquire these groups and acquire these spaces or sponsor these groups and sponsor these spaces and plug your content within them, but there's also an opportunity to invest in the groups that are actually having people say, I want to sell my domain. I want to um, buy some finance blogs. I want to sell a site that's about language learning or my old blog, right? You can see this one at the top. It has links from BuzzStream, from Neil Patel, et cetera, Cognitive, Seer, all kinds of big brands linking to it. That's an opportunity. And you can find these too if you are curious, if you make the time to invest more and guess less. Another opportunity that I want to call out is something that Air Airbnb has done with complete and amazing success. And that was the implementation of a strategy where they started to roll out across the board a bunch of URLs that were essentially the same, ex same exact format every single time. Airbnb.com slash state slash stays. So they have a bunch of these stays pages that they created at scale with the only variable changing on the landing pages are dynamic text surrounding the actual location, exactly the uh, imagery that is related directly to this space. And they did this at scale across almost every single city, every single major country, every single major province, et cetera, in the globe. This was an investment. It was an investment in a type of asset that scales really, really well. But the intent of this asset is completely different from the intent of investing in a meme. When they invest in this type of asset, they're investing for search. They're investing to increase and generate organic traffic. So they started to create a bunch of these pages. They created hundreds of thousands of them. And guess what? When you look at the traffic, it turns out that 12 of them, only 12 of these landing pages, make up 50% of their total traffic to these pages. This is not a bad thing. This is not a bad thing. It just means that they were able to uncover some of those pages, some of those opportunities that we would call in the wonderful world of investing as a hundred bagger, meaning you invest a little bit of money, but you get a hundred X the return on the back of these assets. They are rare, but when you can when you are able to produce this many assets, you're going to eventually have some that ultimately pay for themselves in 10x, 20x, 30x, 100x returns. This is the power of scalable content. Scalable landing pages, leveraging dynamic content is a massive opportunity in the wonderful world of SEO. And if you can do it well and produce all of these pieces, you can unlock some amazing returns and find that 100 bagger for your own business. If you're wondering what I'm talking about when I say 100 bagger, where it's essentially those companies, those stocks that you invest in, that 100x, they grow 100 times their actual initial investment. They are rare. Everybody wants them. Everybody's striving for them, but they are very, very rare. Between 1962 and 2014, there were only 365 of them. Monster was one of them, right? McDonald's was one of them. So once in a while, you will see these 100 baggers, but they are rare. And when you are creating content and investing in content, I challenge you to think, could this someday be 100x? Is the topic that we're covering, is the stories that we're creating, do they have the opportunity to go to the moon? right? Because if they do, then it might be something that is worth investing in. But you can apply this same thinking to other niches, right? You hear me talk about, okay, so Airbnb use scalable landing pages, vacation rentals in a certain place, and then they just change the word place to all of the different locations. They were able to do that in the back end. It's easy. It's smooth. That makes sense. But what in the world could I do if I'm in the email marketing software space? You can use this for inspiration around maybe you niching down right? So instead of you just creating a landing page called email marketing, you put email marketing for a niche, top related features in this niche. And then it links to a piece about how that niche can use segmentation to win, right? 
So you can do it for doctors, for small business, for realtors, consultants, yada, yada, yada. You can customize it for your own space. Invest more, guess less. You have to look for inspiration in industries that have nothing to do with yours and study and look for content excellence. And when you see that content excellence, try to emulate it, right? Another great example of that is the folks at Salesforce and what they've done as it relates to the phrase CRM, right? It's a simple keyword, but they've been owning that keyword since 2016. So when you go to Google and you type in, what is a CRM? I'm pretty confident right now, if you did that search, Salesforce is gonna show up. Why? Because they embrace an investing strategy called hold and optimize. Hold on for dear life, folks, right? Like if you are able to create a piece of content that ranks well in Google, hold on to it. Make sure that you are optimizing it. Make sure that you are making the time and energy to keep it up to date. It is a disservice to the internet to just let that piece lose its value, to lose its credibility. And, hubs, and Salesforce has done that consistently. Year over year, they make updates to the page on their site called What is CRM, right? They've modified the title from just What is CRM to CRM 101, What is CRM? Maybe because they realize that when you put the word CRM at the beginning, it's more likely that you're going to actually rank for just the phrase CRM. So they're able to increase their traffic. And that is a lesson that they learned between 2016 and 2018, right? They always start it with, this is a simple definition of the CRM. Why do they start it with that? Because feature snippets rolled out and they knew if they included that, it might help make it easier for Google to say, this is the definition. Let's pop this right in the SERP, right? You have the opportunity to hold on to your content that you've invested in. Because what we saw amidst the recession is very much likely to happen next year, the year after that, and the year after that. What is that that I'm talking about? The increased demand for the phrases and the content and the stories that you can tell. More people in 2025 will be going to Google looking for CRM content than there were looking for that content in 2016. That's essentially a high growth SEO investment that they were able to capitalize on, that they were able to hold, and they've been able to continue to optimize for years. And it's been able to pay dividends for them. We all want charts like this. We all want our investments to look like this. We all want our content traffic to look like this. And when you think about the market, when you think about search, think about them just like this. There's going to be moments where you're going to have a little bit of a depression. There's going to be moments where you're going to have massive spikes and things are going to cross right back down. But for the most part, when you zoom out, and yes, an algorithm might hit you one day and it makes you feel like, oh, this sucks. We're, we're, we're no longer going to succeed at this. You have to remember that the game is long and you have to invest in your content assets, understanding that things typically continue to move up and to the right because consistently the market is a very long game. And it's the time that you spend in the market that matters more than what it is that you invest in. So I would encourage you to think about how you can invest and maintain a risk tolerance that is right for you. Some of your content should be sales enablement. Some of your content should be growth. Some of it should be thought leadership. You have to figure out the right investment for you. And that's only going to come from conversations internally. That's going to come from a quick review of your resources in front of you and understanding what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And when you make that decision that you're going to invest more and guess less, you will be able to unlock amazing returns. But you're probably thinking, Ross, you just threw a lot of things at us. What in the world am I supposed to do next? Do I create memes? Do I create tools? Do I create blog posts? Do I focus on SEO? Do I get dynamic landing pages? At one point, you were talking about Slack and Discord. What in the world am I supposed to do? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to challenge yourself for one quarter to convince your team to create, convince the org to just for three months decide to follow one path and one track. Create in-depth research and resources for three months. Or invest in YouTube videos for three months straight and become great at it. Invest in creating world-class Twitter threads for three months. Invest in high intent landing pages for just three months. Invest in going on a podcast tour for three months. Invest in doing personalized outreach for three months. Invest in one asset consistently and put your all into it, rooted in research. Take the time to invest in an asset class that can move the needle for you for three months. And something tells me that if you do that consistently, your returns are going to be better than mine were on GM. And don't worry, don't cry for me. I got into Tesla as well, so I turned out okay. 
Thank you all so much. I appreciate your time. I hope you're all doing well, and I hope you have an amazing rest of your day. If you have questions, I'd be happy to um, answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Ross. I love that. absolutely love the fact that you're getting across that content as an investment because automatically we do have then a connection to what yeah. we're actually doing from a, a, a content perspective. Um, and we therefore need to invest more and analyze it more and really think about what's going to drive that needle. I also loved your example of um, what is CRM because you often think when we think of content, we always automatically attend to go into that non-branded mode right but actually the branded mode's also key to crack because it's yeah. ultimately it's your business card online and um, on the serp um so absolutely fantastic material have a Thank question you. here that every piece of content is an asset you mentioned but like if i have a website that just has like standard web pages and i have a blog how can i then and what metrics can you suggest see if my website and that content i.e the landing page and the blog is actually performing well what metrics mm. do you recommend? Yeah, so I think you have to start by looking at good old-fashioned traffic and seeing which which uh, pieces that you've produced are generating traffic. And then you have to double-click a little bit further and ask yourself, is it organic traffic? Is it social traffic? Is it referral traffic? What type of traffic is coming to these various assets? And what is the most valuable type of traffic for you to generate? And then all of that is going to help understand and help you inform what assets are actually producing the results that you want and are being the right investment. Because if you notice that a certain type of content is generating a whole bunch of organic traffic and that organic traffic is ultimately leading to the vast majority of the growth in sales and revenue and business like KPIs, then that's what you want to do more of. That's what you want to invest in. So you might scale back on the other types of content that were getting social, but the traffic wasn't turning into anything. And that is where you want to start viewing your content like an investment, because you're not going to invest in things that aren't going to give you return. You're going to invest in the things that are driving results for you. And if you see that organic traffic drive into these assets or ultimately giving you ROI, you don't stop doing it. You invest heavily in it and you continue to invest heavily into it unless and until you're no longer get no longer able to get returns from it. But it doesn't end with traffic, right? Like you can also look at things like if your goal for your website is to generate just a lot of buzz and conversations surrounding a certain topic, you have to ask yourself, like, are we getting comments? Are we getting engagements on these pieces? If you're trying to develop assets and blog posts that you want these landing pages to rank with, maybe you're thinking about backlinks, right? Like maybe you're thinking about it differently. So you have to start by having a conversation with yourself around what is it that we're trying to do? What is the intent of these investments? What is the intent of the content we're creating? And then use that to inform your approach so you can figure out what you should stop doing and what you should start doing. Amazing. Um, what are your thoughts on translation when you mentioned that if every content should be created differently, mm. what is your thoughts on translation of the same content just in a different market and language? I'm a big fan. I think translations and content is one of the most underrated and underinvested in opportunities today. And it will be next year and it will be the year after that. And it will be the year after that because a lot of marketers have a complete, which is sometimes very rationalized and very much well thought out belief that like everyone speaks English, like, but that's not the truth, right? Mm -hmm. There's so much opportunity when you start to view yourself as a global organization and you start to translate your content for different markets. And you'd be surprised, I would say, by how many, how much of an increase in conversion rates you will find when you actually translate your content to the native language of someone. Because when they see that content, they're more likely to respond to it. And on a lot of social platforms, you can actually run ads it's targeting people based off of their language and it's lower cost because there's not a lot of competition who's actually taking the time to translate their content so when you create that content in their language and you put it in front of them the conversion rates are higher but also the cost is lower because it's less competitive so yes i believe translation is a massive opportunity but i think it's one of those opportunities that for a very long time people are going to continue to sleep on while a few brands that are understanding this opportunity and view it as an arbitrage opportunity take complete advantage of it fabulous and just to add on to that even from a local search perspective it's super valuable when we think about translation it's things like what, what is the local street actually called when you're doing directions to the store? Right. Equally so, naming things like landmarks, if it's in London, a tube station really helps the search engines to figure out where is this store and yeah. they use those little um, 
numbers and, and phrases and stuff to actually try and work out more accurately wh where they actually position this store from where yeah. the searcher is. Um, you mentioned that risky content. Would it be a fair statement to say that white papers and definitions, so therefore more factual content is lower risk? I would say so. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Like when you're just giving someone the facts, the, the straight information, that's relatively low risk. But when you make a hot take, like me saying, I believe that Reddit is the best marketing tool out there in the world, people are going to be like, whoa, that's interesting, right? And that's like on a whole different level of risk because not every brand is going to be comfortable saying that. Not every brand is going to be comfortable investing in Reddit. So those are the things that I would say are more risky. It's when you are do, putting out there an opinion, when you are putting out there um, a thought that goes against the, the current status quo. If you're challenging a philosophy or a belief that so many people in a certain space actually believe, those are risky pieces of content to create. But with that risk comes also a significant opportunity for return. Amazing. And the last question here is, when thinking about what's actually working for my website, should I be considering which parts of my website or which topics are ranking well? Should I be looking at, at, at what other metrics should I be looking at to figure out what is working well for me? You should be looking at all of that, right? Like all of that data is important. You need to be looking at a competitive analysis between every single landing page that is showing up in the SERP and saying, how many backlinks does this one generate? How many, um, what are those backlinks? What do they look like? Where are they coming from? You need to be looking at the on-site content for these pages. How are they structured? Are they structured differently? What is the keyword density for a specific keyword or a phrase that is showing up on these pages? Where, what are the, um, what's the strategy that they're taking when they're educating people on this content. I think we also need to understand like when people are doing search, there's different types of intent. And you have to ask yourself like, what is Google perceiving as the intent for these search phrases? And then when you understand that, you wanna ensure that the content that you're creating has aligned intent. So somebody typing into Google, what is a CRM is not looking for a piece of content that compares five different CRM tools and has a call to action saying buy now, right? They're looking for education. They're looking for them to learn about what a CRM is. So Google is going to serve them an educational asset. So that landing page that you've created, that you've included in the nav CRM, is probably not going to rank unless it's educational. So starting with the, all of the stuff that you've described, but also diving deep into the human and understanding their intent, their psychology, and what they want is also important. I love it. The buyer's journey is is absolutely crucial when you're thinking about buyers or people and, and getting so people is absolutely crucial. Ross, thank you so much indeed for your time. I really appreciate it. We've only got three minutes left and no further questions. So I'll give you those back to your busy schedule. Thanks awesome. So much. Thanks so much. Really appreciate you having me. And folks, if you want to connect, add me on LinkedIn, add me on Twitter. Be sure to mention that you heard me on the similar web uh, webinar and I'll be sure to connect with you. Appreciate you all. All the best, Ross. Take care. Bye-bye.